Before I begin my review of the second episode of Star Trek Picard Season 3, entitled Disengage, I want to begin with the following preamble. I was recently on a live stream with the critical drinker, Mauler, Robert Meyer Burnett, and Gary from Nerdrotic. Now, Drinker, Robert, and Gary and myself have all seen Picard Season 3, though I believe at the time of that stream, Drinker had only seen the first six episodes. The rest of us have seen all ten. Now, all of us were in agreement that Picard Season 3 is a great season of television, despite some flaws, and regardless as to whether the improvement is in fact too little too late. I'd like to take a moment to respond to Cecil Says on Twitter. Now, Cecil, I can confidently tell you that Picard Season 3 does not devolve into wokeness. But you don't have to take my word for it. In a few weeks' time, you can take the word of those people who will watch to the end. They will tell you the same thing. With that out of the way, spoilers for Episode 2 only ahead. The episode continues a theme of the series, beginning with a flashback. Two weeks before Picard and Riker stole a shuttle from the Titan to rescue Beverly Crusher and her son Jack on the Helios, the ship was intercepted by some Fenris Ranger vessels while delivering medical supplies. Jack banters and haggles with the lead ranger during an inspection, bribing him with some weapons to look the other way, but this ranger is actually in contact with someone and communicates a message that they've found Jack. This young man appears to be highly sought after, but why? Back in the present day, Riker, Jack and Picard are on the Helios and under attack from a large alien warship. Picard wonders who is out there. Why are the Crushers being pursued? Jack explains that lots of people have been coming for them in recent weeks. Rangers, Klingons, even Starfleet. On the Titan, they've detected the alien ship in the nebula. They also know it's packing a lot of firepower. Now, there's some disagreement between Seven of Nine and Captain Shaw. What I like about the tension between the two of them is that the conflict doesn't seem arbitrary. Shaw may be a cantankerous sort of guy, but when he argues his point of view on something, you can clearly see the logic behind it. You may not agree with him, but you can't definitively say that he's wrong in his thinking. He believes it's not worth risking the lives of 500 crew members on the Titan to save just two officers, Picard and Riker. As he says, in a brilliantly written and delivered line, if that ship decides to engage us, we are outgunned, and I am not going to risk 500 souls for two relics who think that a couple of brass medals make them golden boys. They dug their grave, they took you with them. On the Helios, Riker remarks to Picard how there's something familiar about Jack, hinting what the audience is no doubt thinking, that this young man is Picard's son, a child he must have had with Beverly. The alien ship destroys the shuttle that was docked to the Helios, stranding the three men on the underpowered and diminutive medical starship. The credits roll. We now cut away to Rafi's ongoing investigation, a terrorist attack on the Starfleet recruitment building that was destroyed by a portal device. As I mentioned before, Rafi's stuff isn't really that engaging in the beginning and tends to drag on a little bit. When you watch it, you just want to get back to the Titan again. She's working for someone in Starfleet Intelligence, but her contact is keeping their identity secret, communicating with her only through text transmission on the La Serena. Her investigation leads her to another underworld figure, a Ferengi by the name of Sneed. Back on the Titan, Seven of Nine convinces Shaw to go back and save Picard and Riker by considering the fact that he could be remembered as the hero who saved two legends. On the Helios, they've been boarded, a firefight ensues and Picard sets up transport inhibitors, which kick into action the moment the alien ship attempts to beam out Jack. This is what's wonderful about this season, you finally get to see Picard once again large and in charge, and on numerous occasions in command, which he really wasn't in the first two seasons. What we can see here clearly is that someone wants to beam Jack off the ship meaning that it's him they want, alive. The alien vessel locks a tractor beam onto the Helios. With the ship's hull integrity failing, and Beverly's medical pod almost out of power, Jack turns to Picard, saying in a wistful manner, Well, it was nice meeting you. Suggesting he knows exactly what the connection is between himself and Picard. In an awesome moment, the Titan flies in and disrupts the tractor beam. They're all safely beamed aboard the Titan, 
The captain of the alien vessel hails them and introduces herself. This is Captain Vadek of the Shrike. I have to say, I do admire Amanda Plummer's performance, as she really relishes the role and throws herself fully into it. She does a very good job. Having said that, I'm not really a fan of this character. I feel she was written a little too arch and eccentric, but that's only part of my criticism. I obviously can't say anything about Vadek's motivations or history at this point in the season, because those details are revealed later in the season, and I won't give anything away. It's hard for me to comment and analyse this character purely based on what's in this episode alone, given that I know what's to come. Suffice to say, my critiques of Vadek are purely based upon my own subjective tastes and feelings. It might be that fans end up loving this character in the future as a cherished and memorable Star Trek villain. And I will say that she is an otherwise perfectly serviceable villain who provides a more than sufficiently menacing threat in the story, and so in that regard, she works quite well. I will save my more thorough commentary on Vadek till later in the season. Vadek is sufficiently smug and confident at the armaments of her warship that she lowers her shields to allow the Titan crew to scan her ship so that they know what they're facing. Similarly to Shinzon's scimitar, this ship is a beast and not something that an exploratory vessel like the Titan should be messing around with. To demonstrate her intentions and convictions, she has the Shrike lock a tractor beam on the Elios and flings it at the Titan, causing severe dorsal hull damage. Now, I'm not exactly sure why Picard then asks, what did she just do? It's fairly obvious what just happened. They were hit by a ship, and to be quite honest, they probably should have seen it coming, reacting just a little too late. Still, that's something we've never seen on Star Trek before, an entire ship being thrown at another ship. Very novel indeed. In the conference room, they want answers from Jack as to why these bounty hunters are after him. They're on the fringes of Federation space, cornered and with no backup. Shaw has had about enough of this situation. He reveals the various aliases Jack has used over the years and considers him a con man. He's escorted to the brig and Seven of Nine is relieved of duty. Jack definitely has a dodgy track record, but he's an honourable thief. It's very strange that a warship like Vadix would go to all this trouble to find him. There has to be something more to this man than merely a standard smuggler's criminal record. Picard and Jack talk about all of this in the brig. Jack reveals he never had a father, but there's something unspoken between the two men. It's becoming increasingly obvious. Jack agrees to be handed over to Vadik to save his mother. Picard disagrees, citing that he should have the justice of courts and not criminals. To turn him over is to acquiesce. Meantime, we cut back to Rafi. She's met with Sneed, a broker in the underworld. This relates to the stolen portal tech used to take down the recruitment centre. Though this part of the plot may seem a bit drawn out at this point, I'm pleased to say it starts picking up really quickly after this scene. And that's the only teaser I'll give you right now. This is the scene I told you about a few weeks ago, when I said there was something Rafi was asked to do that she didn't want to do, something she was trying to put behind her, her drug usage. Unfortunately, she has to take drugs in front of Sneed in order to prove she's not Starfleet, which considering what her character has gone through over the years, I thought it was pretty dark and bordering on cruel, not exactly family-friendly Star Trek. At any rate, this whole situation starts to go south for Raffi, as Sneed orders his men to kill her, but thankfully her handler shows up to save her, and what better man to come to her rescue than the ultimate badass Klingon warrior, Worf. For all those people worrying he was a pacifist because of one of the trailers, well, put your fears to rest. He guts these guys in short order and then decapitates Sneed. Now, the decapitation was unnecessary in my view. I called this kind of thing out in season one when Elnor did it to a Romulan. If I'm being consistent, I have to do the same here. At any rate, Sneed is done and Worf picks up Raffi. We get the classic Klingon music theme and he says, I told you, do not engage. Jack manages to use some kind of device to get out of the brig. He intends to give himself up and beam aboard Vadik's ship. 
Shaw doesn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth and gives the order to unlock the transporters to allow the young man to beam over. But then Riker brings Beverly to the bridge and there is a long, unspoken emotional exchange between herself and Picard. Without having to say anything, Picard figures out that Jack is indeed his son. He immediately springs into action, ordering that the transporters be locked down. Shaw asks why he's doing this, to which Picard responds, in a lump in the throat kind of moment, because he's my son. It's a powerful scene, extremely well acted and directed, and the music really sells the heartfelt sentiment behind it all. Shaw backs down and orders full power to forward shields. Picard gives Vadik his answer as the Titan fires a full volley of torpedoes at the Shrike and makes its way further into the nebula. It's a great ending. Vadik laughs maniacally as the Shrike follows the Titan. The episode ends. So, two down, eight to go. As you can see, the quality of writing and characterization is consistent on like seasons one and two, and it continues like this for the rest of the season. If you're not hooked into the story by now, you certainly will be if you give it till the brilliant episode 4. I personally think 5 and 6 are the best of the season. Things are just heating up now, and frustratingly the episode ends just as things are getting spicy. Now there were of course those people who were still on the fence about the show after the first episode, and I think you can see now that the tone and consistency in pacing, the wonderful interplay between the characters, the cohesion of the story, it's all there, very much so. Yes, the dark bridge lighting and occasional swearing lets the season down in my view, but I can overlook these details because of everything else that makes the season worthwhile. I had the benefit of watching the episodes back to back, so I could make an assessment on the entire season in just a few hours. For you guys watching at home, you're having to make an assessment over the course of several weeks, but I can assure you it'll be worth it. I think this is another solid episode. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching. Please hit that like button and if you're new, please subscribe. Take care and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.